Hello and welcome to Truth to Power. Truth to Power is a program where we bring up issues happening in and around Nigeria, most especially in communities that have been persecuted. And these persecuted communities are scattered mostly around the Middle Belt and Northern Nigeria. Today on the program, we shall go on with where we stopped in the last edition where we, try, where, where we attempted to look at the history and of course the impact on communities. On the program today, we'll go further to see how this impact also directly affects the economic life of persons living in these persecuted minority groups in Northern and Central Nigeria. My name is Ehis Adbo. Today on the podcast, I have um, a gentleman, he's a journalist, a reporter, and one that has done several works around persecuted communities and of course uh, areas in Nigeria where bandits are having a field day. Let me welcome Mike Ode Akatu to the podcast today. Thanks, Big Boss. All right, Thanks, nice. you're welcome. Mike, looking at the issue of um, persecution in Nigeria, some people don't want to see it as persecution, they give it different colorations. But for you, is it persecution that is happening, or what exactly is happening? It is persecution and uh, state sponsored persecution, I see. And I'll be very honest with you. You see, um, period to Shegumi's travels to the bandits camp. The federal government would not want to admit that they were organized group of persons killing people in the middle of I hope you understand what I'm saying, and in the north. The federal government, who I himself said these guys are from um, Libya. They are from Libya at one time, the other time again he said they are they are from Niger. He don't want to really say anything about it. But when Gumi traveled to Katsina to uh, Zamfara to Niger, he discovered that there were huge, I mean, numerous persons who have arms and ammunition and are controlling territories. And from there, they launch attacks on persecuted communities. And um, all of a sudden, again, these people are known by their tribes, they are Fulani Hesmen, and I'm not saying all the Fulanis are guilty of such. In short, that is why we call them Fulani Hesmen. There are Fulanis that are living just like you are, millions of them. They are not bothered about all these things. In short, a lot of them too are victims of this very persecution, of these very killings that is happening. So when Buhari came to power and this killings was ongoing, he started he started talking to the media, he started um, which word would I use? He started like intimidating the media not to use the term Fulani. They should use s men And people were wondering why are you saying they should not use Fulani? So why don't you call white white speed is speed? And uh, maybe it was because of his tribe so we later have to see, okay, it is no longer Fulani, but headsmen. But we know even the headsmen are also Fulanis, no matter how you call them. Then, the government went silent. The government never really wanted us to see these people. These people are organized and they are killing. Are you getting it? And that, and I'll tell you, take you back to 2018, if you remember on Ground Zero, mm-hmm. when uh, then we lost about 72 of its victims, I mean 72 of its citizens. Mm-hmm. The governor of town, then the governor of Benue, organized a mass burial and he invited the media, international media, to come and cover it. And for that reason, he was actually chased out of APC, the ruling party. He decamped not too long to, to, to PDP. The, gov- the president in particular was not happy about him bearing, giving mass burial to people that were slaughtered. And, so public and then they begin to ask, what is the interest of the president? Why is he hiding the fact that ex-men who has openly stated that we did this thing, Gololo never hid it. He said they did it in return for the, 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 the revenge killing. Are you with me? Yeah. And so, Bololo, uh, you know, so the president was not really happy. And then, again, in Ondo State, when the killings by the same organized persons were happening, 
coming from the Ondo forest, Governor Akere Dolu gave all the all the, the dwellers in the forest, including the headsmen, seven days to quit the headsmen, to quit the forest of Ondo and come and register with them. The government, the federal government, who has no authority, jurisdiction over the state, reacted that they should not go anywhere. You know, so that's why I said they are state sponsor. And you see, now, when you say it is not, when people want to argue it is not a persecution, what, what it is, what is it when a particular set of persons organize themselves and say this is what we are going to do to this particular set of people and it is continuing and the government seems not to have an answer or deliberately refuse to have an answer have delved into being let's go to uh, southern Kaduna. Yeah. the killings have been ongoing and uh, i will give you another example when the adara community came out to speak out i covered their protest one black friday in uh, zango kata and they were so they were so vociferous and they stated this they they ensure they listed the numbers of times they have been the their people have been killed. They listed the villages and they pointedly accused the administration of the they accused the Elfa administration of lackluster behavior towards them. And they also said that the military would not take action when these bandits, these headsmen, known as Fulani headsmen, come to attack them. Erufa be there this time before he would go. He banned, he prescribed the Adana. I mean the uh, Atia uh, uh, and the community, the, the organization, the, the organization that spoke out. Again, Erufa was on channels television saying that Christians, Christian clerics are fond of going to international community to say that churches have been burnt by headsmen. So that this community, this, uh, so that um, the international community will give them money, and then they can rebuild the church. And even said that the government is tracking them, taking record security agencies on them, and at a date, those people will be brought to book. You can never see a refire talking that, saying that about the Fulani men, about the houses, but only the community where those people were persecuted. Now let's go to Plateau State. Before the coming of um, the former governor, the that uh, is Solomon Lalong. Yeah. Plateau has also been at the butt of the killings. The Fulanis were killing and they were killing and they were killing. And there is this major general Sally, I've forgotten his other name, that was brought to to head the tax force. And the Bureau Mutes have always been shouting that the tax force under General Sully has is prosecuting or was prosecuting the Bureau Mutes to the point of shooting them rather than shooting at the the bandits or the people killed the Fulani killing them. In those days, when you get up, it's not uncommon to hear news that 20 have been slaughtered by Fulani bandits yeah. on the plateau. 30 have been slaughtered. And my brother, Mr. Hayes. Nigeria has the land component of an armed forces. We've been to Liberia, we restored peace to Liberia, Sierra Leone. We were in Tanzania in the 60s. We fought a bloody civil war. We incorporated the East back. We were in Lebanon. We were in Somalia when the Americans failed woefully. You understand? We have, I said we have then we have we have more than 150,000 soldiers. Yeah. We have Air Force. We have the Navy, we have the paramilitary, such as the, the civil defense, who are also on that camp. We have others. But the killings in Plateau defy all odds. Is it that the government is afraid of taking action? We don't know. Now, the, the killings persisted. And I will tell you something again. Jang, who was then the governor, yeah, um, raised an alarm sometimes that some people were caught carrying arms and they, have, they were arrested by the police. 
the jurisdiction of the police, the, the Plateau State Police Command was supposed to put, put them in Plateau, those people that were caught. Yeah. But the army under Air Adwa took them to Abuja. And I stand to be corrected. One of those that were arrested, Mama Nob, later, when the army took them to, to Abuja, Jang complained seriously that they have been taken to Abuja and they will be freed. One of those that was arrested in Plateau mm -hmm. ended up planning the bombing of the United Nations headquarters in Abuja. Mm -hmm. His name is Mama No. Mm -hmm. After the bombing, he escaped to Somalia. Mm -hmm. Are you getting it? Yeah. So somehow, we have a federal government who is in charge of the armed forces. And we have the civilian president, democratically elected, who are also, who are, who, who is the commander, who are represented by the president, who is the commander, and they are refusing from Yar Adwa down to Buhari, and probably, I don't know, Tinubu for now, they are, they refused to take actions to protect the minority, hmm. the so-called minority. So if that is not persecution, then what it is? And normally, those minorities that are refused protection are Christians. Whether they are Birons, whether they are thieves, whether they are Domas, whether they are Atiyahs, you discover that they are Christians. And all the time, the government will always, the federal government will always come defend their actions against the people. Like in the case of Plateau, where the killings was too much. Uh, she, she, she came out to say, uh, uh, sorry, you know, no, 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 in the okay, case of Sada Kaduna, yeah. I said, Kaduna, Sada Kaduna has some of the best security networks given, all the people need to do now, they should accommodate, they should be, be peace loving, this and that, this and that. In the case of Benue, Femi Adishino, a pastor, because he was serving a master, said, if these people want your land, give them the land so that I can live in peace. Are you getting it? Mm -hmm. Is that not persecution? It, not, it does not only go around in, like that. Now, let's look at Kano. We are some certain persons, Christian particularly, are living in fear. In those days, if there is a bomb blast in Lebanon or Israel, there is a protest in Kano. Yeah. And Christians are the butt of the attack. Mm -hmm. You understand? And normally the perpetrators are not caught. The perpetrators are not caught. I'll give you another example. Um, Deborah Samuel in Sokoto yeah. was accused of defaming the prophet of Islam. And now the laws are very clear about that. If you are accused of defamation, there are courts that will do the sentences. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this person was not given protection. She was she was brutally murdered, burnt, and the police could not apprehend the, the perpetrators. They ran to the general public, so according to the police. And in recent times, when some of them were brought to the police station, they were acquitted. They were set free. You see, now. I tell you again, juxtapose that with what happens in Christian community if a Fulani ex man is killed. Over here, somebody told me, I look, something saved us from the army. He said, What? He said, a Fulani boy was killed, with, and then his body thrown, to, with them thrown outside in their own community. Then, all of a sudden, army surrounded the community. And started threatening, you must bring out the killers of these full animals. How many times have the Nigerian army gone into the camps of the full animals and said, Bring out, we want to know who are the people killing the minorities. And the army was threatening, threatening, not until the father of the boy said, Look, my son has a dash here, and so dash comes one. The weapon that we call it Barandani that is normally used by the Fulanis. I'm not sure it is people from this place that killed my son. My son had a problem, a quarrel with a Fulani man before now. Let's go and meet that one. That was what saved the community. 
Wow. You understand? Yeah. Now, let's, you see, so, the Christians that have been killed are, I don't know, they are persecuted. They are persecuted. They call us minorities and anything that happens. And it, it seems like it exacerbated during the times of President Buhari. But if you look at it very well, during the time of Yer Adwa, it was almost like that. Even Abbas Rindo, it came out. That was why when Dari, the governor, made a statement that certain particular persons who are foreigners, who are not from this state, are causing problems, Abbas Rindo quickly removed Joseph Joshua Dari. Are you getting it? Yeah. In the case of Jan, after the South Just North crisis, and Jan was determined to end it. The president then, Yar Adwa, stepped in. Jan had to go to the court to see. In short, Yar Adwa was like, I want to impose, I want to set up a committee of inquiry and then find out. Then, and the governor said, No, no, it is my jurisdiction. Yeah. Let's go to the courts. Are you getting it? Anything that has to do with Fulani terrorists, bandits, killing Christians, the federal government is either aloof or trying to be on the defensive. All right. Yeah. Um, just to let you know that you are watching and listening to the podcast Truth to Power, and it's a podcast that uh, we extray uh, persecution that happens to minority groups in central and northern Nigeria mostly. And uh, on the program, we bring up these issues, try to analyze them, try to get a better understanding and try to also provide solutions to some of these uh, issues. And it comes to you um, every Thursday with a rerun on Sundays from 7 to 7.30. And the program is proudly supported by Truth Nigeria. Truth Nigeria is a website where you get up-to-date information about what's happening within and around Nigeria and all over the world. And uh, you may want to go to Truth Nigeria's website at www.truthnigeria.com www.truthnigeria.com is written on your screen now. Just go there, check out the stories, you get the latest uh, security alert that's coming from hotspots in Nigeria and also getting the latest detailed stories covering religion, covering entertainment, politics, news and current affairs. Visit Truth Nigeria and get the best of all of this. Now we'll come. We've heard about these persecutions, which we can never stop talking about. But looking at the impact of this persecution, how has it affected some of these states? Let's uh, take, for example, uh, Southern Kaduna. The the, the 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 means or source of livelihood of persons living in these communities. How would you say the persecution and terrorist attacks have affected these communities? Now, if you look at Southern Kaduna, I two years ago I was talking to Reverend uh, Dauda Azaman, and um, they were having a brief part with everybody. And they were saying that some of their land, farmland, has been occupied by the headsmen after chasing away the, the, the locals, the landowners. The headsmen started grazing on their land, even the plot to that apples. And Erufa was saying, Shh, give me the names of this land, of this area, of these communities that you said you claim were occupied. And as a man said, well, I'm, I'm going to get it to you. Give me a long list. I'm sure so Kapu followed it too. Now, and um, it turned out that, and they also followed it to the latter by taking media people some of these areas. And um, this is normally what happens. Southern Kaduna is mainly agrarian society. Yeah. The plateau is, when you talk about plateau, you know, the climate of plateau is called the high plateau. It is like the mountain where it's a mixture of. Um, of um, equatorial and mountain climate, which is very good for conducive for agriculture, for grazing. In short, it's that very climate in the plateau can only be found like in Nigeria, in Obu and Mandela. It is good for all kinds of crops and other things. And of course, the headsmen want it too. And so when communities are dislocated, a huge chunk of farmers will be off their land. Hmm. Remember, 
ginger used to be the in team in those days in Kaduna, ginger yeah. one. Yeah. Are you talking about ginger today? No. Because these people have been chased out their land. Hmm. Now, let's look at the impact of it, not only in Southern Kaduna, but extending to Kaduna and some other areas. You see, Greenfield University was attacked by these bandits. And then after how many days, some of them, about five students, were killed. Uh, the owner of the school almost relocated back to his village, Israel, in Anambra State. He almost went back and closed down the school. It took him almost a year plus or two years to relocate the students back from where, I mean, from the original campus oh, yeah. to Abuja Highway to where he is now. Mm. Now, huge amount of money has been lost. Equipment are lying shallow over there. Yeah. Are you getting it? Not only that, Bethel School that was also kidnapped. Oh, uh, close to about two years in from about two years now, some of these children have not been found. They are still in captivity. A lot of parents are wary, are scared of taking their children to school. I'm a parent. I have four, five lovely kids. Every morning, I would, in those dark days, I was scared of allowing my kids to go to school. And you know where I live. So I had to tell my wife, I don't want, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an international school along that way. And it's very close to the highway. So I told my wife, my wife said, let those kids go. I said, no, no. And I take them to the other, to the part, to the remotest part of of the, I mean, of the community. Mm -hmm. And then we can put them in school. The everyday parents are scared about the safety of their children. Now, a community where people are not living in peace, where people are not having peace of mind, no trading. If you go to Oil Village, Oil Village along this NNPC, which is almost the tail that will be replicated down to Southern Kaduna. People have absconded from their communities. If you go to Bonumora, lying from here and the rest, you discover that in the morning, you see people around. In the evening, it's empty houses. You move to the other side. Right. Yes. The same thing happens in Oil Village. They'll tell you that I was speaking and I have a, I was speaking to a woman and she said since her husband was was executed, was shot, point blank, she had to leave her business, her farm, everything, and then move away to another part. She really comes around to to do things. And then the farmland had even been destroyed by the cattle. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to Southern Kaduna, there's um, a lot of these stories are there. Now farming is the mainstay of the people in that area. So once you touch farming, you have touched everything. You touch everything. Now education prepares the children for tomorrow. If you touch their educational pursuits, you've touched their future. Yeah. So economically. And then we cannot quantify the billions of naira. The ginger is an exporting crop. It's a guy it's a cash crop that, that, that you can export and you make money. I know me I know all the, I mean Many persons that have made millions out of it, but today it is more about, you know, it's no more lucrative as it is because people are scared and you know the price, and you know, people are no longer going to come. So, we're talking about not even life lost alone, every life is worth it. Every life to the government, every life is supposed to be a sacrosanct. Yeah. But today in Nigeria, today, under this very, under the administration of the past president. Lives of these persecuted minorities are like such a water, and we'll keep talking. Hmm. And uh, we'll be wrapping up the program now, but before we do that, we'd like to get um, this uh, advice from uh, you in respect of mm -hmm. how you think um, this issue should be solved, or what do you think needs to be done to uh, curtail the persecution of minority groups in Nigeria. You see, the first of all, I will uh, advise Christians, Northerners, Middle Belters, to be peaceful in the way they go. Don't take arms up against the federal government, but please be security conscious. And secondly, 
I would like to advise the government that the community, the international community is watching. Omar Obashir tried the same thing. The federal government, all uh, the people that are massacring middle daughters, I have taken a page out of the Chancha with. That's just a plain truth. Mm. But the federal government is watching. And if we continue to highlight the killings that is taking place, one day a lot of people will stand trial at the aid or ICC. I can assure you that. Again, I will advise the federal government to kindly know that the people that they are persecuting are there, I mean, they are allowing to be persecuted are their next door neighbor. They voted them into power. That is just the plain truth. We are not actually minority. When you go to Benue, we are in the majority. When you go to Southern Kaduna, we are in the majority. In the majority. When you go to Plateau, they are in the majority plus Ma one. When you go to Taraba, they are in the majority. When you go to uh, Bauchi, what they exist and the rest, you find huge numbers of Christians. I didn't those states were merged together. You discover that that state would have been producing Christian, but they were split. <laughs> Are you getting it? So, when you, you look at the case of Zulu, Zulu was actually removed from Niger to decrease the population and taken to Kebi. You understand? So, we are not, if the Christians are in the north, they are that much, then they are not minority. Then secondly, my advice to Christians is this, especially to journalists. I guess you are doing a great job Thank you. by bringing out these things. You see, um, in Baggy Villa, to May 28, 27, mm. about seven churches were pulled down in Baggy Villa. Baggy Villa is a community, a suburb in uh, Chukun local, local, local government of Cardinal State. Seven to eight churches were pulled down. Only Israel Bulus of Punch newspaper, Gabriel Dibia mm. and I were there to cover it. The other organizations, television stations, never went. They never bothered to carry the story. And we were putting it that so persons, these churches have been pulled down. As of the time I left that place, two persons were shot. And the reports were getting, two others were killed, others were being killed, and pictures, gory pictures were coming out. The media which is also dominated by Christians, refuse to carry it, they are afraid. So if the, my advice to the media is, what would it cost you to gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Because when they come after the, the Catholics, and you refuse to talk because you are not Catholic, by the time they come after you, by the time they are done with the Catholic, they come after you. So the media needs to highlight the persecution and call it, don't call it black, white. If it is the Fulanis that kill, the Fulani Esmen, say it's the Fulani Esmen that is killing. If the army did not take action on time, say if the army so so time did not come on time. And if it is the Christians that are killing or have stolen cattle, you'll be objective about it. Say the Christians have stole these people's cattle. They are wrong. Let's be just. Let's be fair. So, and that is how we'll try. And I will also appeal to the Christians to be united. If they are united and be the Christians in Plateau, see the Christians in Southern Karuna, see the Christians in Kebi, in Borno, as one in Plateau, do you know there is power in unity? Yeah. So let's be united. And that's exactly what we will be advising today on the podcast, Truth to Power. There is power in unity. That's about the size of this edition of the podcast, Truth to Power. And... Uh, the podcast is proudly supported by Truth Nigeria. To get more information and details about Truth Nigeria, visit www.truthnigeria.com. Meanwhile, in the coming weeks, we'll be carrying out a dance routine. That's a dancing competition amongst kids in IDPs. That's internally displaced persons camps in the middle belt of Nigeria, majorly Kaduna State, Plateau State, Nasarawa State, Benue State, and of course the FCT and guess what kids in this camp deserve to have smiles on their face if children outside can have fun why not children in the camp let's see how we'll make this happen and Truth Nigeria will be bringing out details of this also in the coming week my name is Ehis Adon next week Thursday from 7 p.m. you'll have the opportunity of listening to a fresh edition of Truth to Power and uh, 7 p.m. is at uh, 7 o'clock uh, West 
Facts and Central African Time. So please join us then. Until next time, like always, I will say to you this evening, even as you go about your daily activities, remember that you need to speak truth to power all of the time. <laughs>